This paper asks the question, can Gene Roddenberry learn anything from Terry Nation? I will take a look in order to answer it at the position of women in Star Trek and Blake 7. In fairness to Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, it must be said that the secondary status of women in the original TV series was not altogether his fault. Roddenberry's series concept had a starship with a woman captain, a 50-50 sex distribution of crew members, and an assumed atmosphere of complete equality. This captain would have been played by Major Barrett, who became Major Barrett Roddenberry. But the notion that a mere female could possibly be in, star in charge of a mighty starship was rejected by Roddenberry's financial backers. His revised series premise was that the Enterprise would have a male captain and an alien woman, played by Major Barrett, as second in command. This concept was filmed as the pilot episode of The Cage, but it was rejected. In the TV series, women regular cast members were kept in their places and limited to conventional female roles. Lieutenant Uhura, the only woman on the bridge crew, is the communications officer. She spends much of her time opening hailing frequencies. In moments of danger, she says things like, I'm frightened, Captain. Only after being flung into a different, savage, parallel universe does Uhura get to assert herself. Nurse Christine Chapel defers to Dr. McCoy. She joined Starfleet for an acceptable female reason, to search for her missing fiancé, Roger Corby. After discovering that Corby had died and been replaced by an android, Chapel transferred her affection to Mr. Spock, the half-alien first officer of the Enterprise. It is clear that her infatuation with the Vulcan is hopeless. Spock does not even want Chapel to make a home eat soup for him. She is a rather pathetic figure with her fluffy blonde hairdo, mini uniform, and twice broken heart. Chapel, incidentally, is also played by Major Barrett. Women crew members in the original Star Trek TV series wore mini skirted uniforms, except for one very early episode in which Dr. Elizabeth Daner wears the same trousered garb as her male counterparts. She is killed in this episode, thus symbolizing an appropriate fate for uppity women who insist on wearing the pants themselves. Janice Rand, who was Kirk's yeoman for a short time, appears as set decoration. In one episode, Kirk assaults her, but this happens when he is not really himself as a result of having been separated into his good and bad halves by a malfunctioning transporter device. Female guest stars are usually young and beautiful, the better to be manipulated and seduced by Captain Kirk. And they are, all, they are often shown as stereotypes and caricatures. Elan of Troyes, for instance, is treated by Kirk as merely a spoiled brat. Evidently, viewers of the, members of the viewing audience were not supposed to be bothered that Elan is being transported unwillingly to a hostile world, where she will be prostituted, in effect, to appease a man who is her cultural enemy. Miramani, the only woman whom Kirk actually marries, he was suffering at the time from total amnesia, is allowed to be beautiful and adoring. She and her people worship Kirk as a deity. She dies, conveniently, at the end of the episode. Even Edith Keeler, a 20th century social worker whom Kirk admires for her farsighted ideas, is only introduced so that she too may die, as Kirk heroically restrains himself and McCoy from saving her life in order not to change for future history. Janice Lester, Kirk's estranged girlfriend, returns in the final series episode. She is a murderous psychopath who has gone insane from inability to accept her proper role as a woman in Federation society. Kirk remarks, remarks pityingly and condescendingly that she could have had a rich, full life for a woman. Presumably, that is, if she had accepted her natural limitations instead of crazily defying them. Anatomy, after all, is still destiny, and women do not get to command starships, at least not in this man's federation. We must ask whether the situation of women in Star Trek has improved in the four more recent feature films. Well, not a whole lot. In the first Trek movie, Uhura, Chapel, and Rand make only token appearances. The ship's Delta navigator, Lieutenant Ilea, is remembered chief, chiefly for having been bald and for pointedly and publicly reaffirming her oath of celibacy, something which no male officers were apparently effect, expected to do. 
Ilea is taken over by a mysterious probe and then becomes an android robot. She disappears forever when the standard impersonal alien menace around which the plot revolves vanishes suddenly. The female guest role in the next movie, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, is that of Carol Marcus, another estranged girlfriend of Kirk's, who is also the mother of his son David. The research project headed by Carol Marcus has been developing the secret Genesis device, which can transform inanimate matter into new life. Although she is obviously an eminent scientist, her main function in this film is to be blonde and fluffy and bat her eyes frequently, while saying things like, believe me, Jim Kirk was never a Boy Scout. Carol Marcus also playfully compares her life's work to cooking, a stereotypically feminine activity. The film's other new woman character is Lieutenant Savick, Spock's protege, who is a trainee on the command track in Starfleet. Savick is lucid, effective, and in control. She remembers regulations at one important point, while Kirk ignores them with disastrous results. Savick returns in the next Trek movie, Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, but here she has been transformed, and not for the better. Robin Curtis replaced Kirstie Alley, the original Savick, because of a salary dispute. Some of the problem with Savick may reflect Curtis's exceptionally wooden acting and the lameness of Leonard Nimoy's direction, but her part was abysmally written. Valkris, the Klingon spy who steals information about the Genesis device and turns it over to the obviously demented Lord Krug, is blown to bits when she has served her purpose. Since Valkris apparently knew all along that this would happen and meets her death willingly, her character is scarcely a testimonial to female intelligence. Uhura has one nice scene in the third movie, in which she intimidates a younger male officer so that her colleagues can steal the Enterprise and return to the Genesis planet disobeying orders from Starfleet. The positive in impact of this scene is reduced, however, by her mini-skirted uniform and high heels. This departure from the now standard uniform trousers was requested by the actress who plays Uhura. Nichelle Nichols wanted to show off her legs. Star Trek IV The Voyage Home is the latest Trek movie. In it, Kirk and his comrades travel backward in time to present-day San Francisco. The film includes token appearances by Uhura, Savik, and Amanda, Spock's mother. Chapel and Rand are seen very briefly in background montage shots. The featured guest character is the 20th century marine biologist, Dr. Jillian Taylor. Although she is assistant director of a research institute, she is shown as a mere tour guide rather than as a person in a position of authority. She is another in the long series of cute, fluffy ingenue figures whom Kirk, as usual, manipulates by turning on his increasingly well-worn boyish charm. Julian Taylor is childish. She loses her temper and slaps her boss, and when she really gets upset, she hits her pickup truck with her pretty little fist. She also bats her eyes and smiles a lot on both shows. The Federation emblem right above the heart on Starfleet uniforms is turned onto its side in Blake 7, showing symbolically that Terry Nation's future universe is one in which Roddenberry's familiar and benign federation has been knocked askew. Terry Nation's series is set in a more distant future, perhaps 800 to 1,000 years from now. The federation has become evil and dictatorial, and most people are kept under subjugation by a combination of official terror and mind-altering drugs. The mood of Blake 7 is as pessimistic as its setting is dystopian. The characters encounter catastrophes rather than triumphs, and these worsen from episode to episode. As what amounts to a tragic epic, Blake 7 is totally different in spirit from Star Trek. Trek is optimistic, positive about the future and about humankind. The main bridge crew characters are good guys, and we know that they will always win. In Gene Roddenberry's universe, even death is not permanent, as evidenced by the recent demise and resurrection of Spock. In Blake 7, for, by contrast, major series characters die, disappear, go insane, are eliminated unpredictably, and the ending, which features wholesale carnage, is not happy. Let's take a fast look at this series, then, since it is still not familiar to most American TV audiences. The most important characters are Blake and Avon. Blake is a charismatic leader, a revolutionary whose personal magnetism seems to inspire others to join his cause willingly. 
Avon is an unusually gifted computer expert who was exiled by the Federation after his schemes were betrayed to the authorities. He is bitter, sarcastic, mistrustful, and paranoid, a superb embodiment of the darkly brooding anti-hero type, the perfect male protagonist of the romantic Gothic tradition. Avon is the main reason of the large, mostly female, following which the series has inspired in this country. There are three other men in the rebel band. Villa is a professional thief who can open any door, also a drunk, a liar, and an apparent coward. Gan is the big, strong, silent man. He was certified insane after murdering a Federation guard who, was, who had raped his girlfriend, and now there is a delimiter implanted in his brain which prevents him from doing anything violent. Tarrant is a former Federation officer who absconded with a ship and turned to running contraband. There are four women among Blake's associates. Jenna is a space pilot who can fly anything. She operated as a free trader, or smuggler, until the Federation caught up with her. Jenna disappears at approximately the middle of the series, and we are only told later on that when she died, she managed to take out a whole squadron of Federation warships along with her. Callie is an alien who possesses telepathic powers. A failed revolutionary, she is killed while still struggling against the Federation. Dana is the young daughter of an exiled rebel scientist who has trained herself to become an expert on weapons and combat. When she was 17, Su Lin hunted down and killed the people who had murdered her parents. And she is entirely prepared to kill again whenever the need arises. What is surprising about the women of Blake Seven, surprising to those of us who grew up with Trek, I mean, is that it is simply taken for granted that they are just as capable and effective as the men. Jenna, Callie, Dana, and Sullivan are highly skilled and intelligent people, not set decorations. Another important aspect of their status, and that of all the rebel band, is that they are people who have chosen to throw in their lots with Blake, and after his disappearance midway through the series, with Avon. They act as free agents, rather than as links in a chain of command. Like bickering siblings in a large family, they argue a lot amongst themselves, go off on tangents, and often deliberately ignore instructions. The social organization of Blake's crew is disorderly and chaotic by comparison with the neat, stable, patriarchal, as Patricia has pointed out to me, family, symbolized by the bridge crew of the Enterprise, which is also, of course, a formal military hierarchy. And how much more patriarchal can one get than that? Blake and Avon do seem to be, in Orwell's phrase, more equal than others, but their superior positions are accorded to them because of a sort of grudging respect for their abilities. Male and female characters are equally attractive, too. If we can say that women in Blake 7 are often dressed as befit sex objects, and they certainly are, well then, so are the men. In this series, costuming seems to reflect personal taste rather than comparative social or sexual value. Ranged in opposition to Blake's ragtag group of rebels and sociopaths are a series of mad scientists, slimy villains, and large-scale gangsters, the most prominent of whom are the Federation Security Forces officer Travis and his superior in both rank and nastiness, Servalan. Servalan is the character who sets this series apart from anything else I've seen on TV. She is fascinating, skillful, witty, intelligent, attractive, and rotten. If you think of Alexis Carrington as the ultimate super bitch, all I can tell you is that Servalan makes Alexis look like Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Servalan just might vaporize a planet or two to work up an appetite for breakfast. She is first seen at the head of the Federation security forces. Later on, she becomes president of the entire Federation. After surviving an intergalactic invasion and the resulting mess, she competently establishes new foundations for a climb right back into power. Servalant is evil personified, and she is quite as strong a character in her negative way, as are the chief positive characters Blake and Avon. It is refreshing that in Terry Nation's Federation, unlike Gene Roddenberry's, a woman can become the most powerful person in the galaxy and can be spectacularly successful, for good or for ill, in her own right. Servalan is also multidimensional. 
Most of the other unsympathetic characters in the series are criminals, psychopaths, or just miserable self-deluded fools. But Servalan is quite, quite lucid. She knows precisely what she is doing. Therein, indeed, lies much of her hypnotic fascination. Blake Seven went off the air in England in late 1981. Almost six years later, in October 1987, Star Trek The Next Generation started up in syndication on American TV. According to Gene Roddenberry, he had total creative control over the new series. Bearing that in mind, let's take a brief look now at the women of Star Trek The Next Generation. Dr. Beverly Crusher is the chief medical <coughs> officer. We have seen little of her medical skills so far, though. What we have seen instead is Crusher as a mother and as a lonely woman, she's a widow, who is obviously attracted to Captain Picard. Her brilliant adolescent son, Leslie, was originally supposed to be her brilliant adolescent daughter, Leslie, but that idea was vetoed at some point. Was there a presumption here, perhaps, that no young girl could be brilliant enough to become an acting ensign and to play around on the bridge with the grown-ups? Deanna Troy is the ship's counselor, whatever that means. She is half Terran and half Betazoid. Instead of being a telepath like Spock, Troy has the power to sense emotions rather than to read specific thoughts. She is constantly feeling this or that, anger, fear, jealousy, whatever. What constructive purpose this accomplishes for the Enterprise is lost on many members of the TV audience. Much of the time, indeed, Troy's real purpose in the series seems to be displaying her looks in deeply plunging necklines and mini uniforms. There is a recurring plot theme about a potential relationship between Troy and Riker, the first officer. She is attracted to him, but realizes that he is totally obsessed with becoming a captain and that nothing will get in his way. Possibly from reaction to Riker's ambition, or maybe because he just happens to be just another standard TV hunk, Troy decides at one point, despite her intelligence and her advanced degree in psychology, to fulfill a Betazoid tradition by marrying a man whom she has never even met. Did I mention that the new Star Trek series has, shall we say, taken some inspiration from the old one? Here we are, hearkening back to poor Spock in a muck time when it looks as if he was going to be stuck with T'Pring, all because of, gasp, his raging hormones. Now, it was a rather nice role reversal when we had a male character being defined very much against his will in terms of his uncontrollable sexuality, remember Ponfar. But when this theme is echoed with Troy, it becomes yet another instance of objectionable sex role stereotyping. As if to underscore the fact that we are supposed to see her as a woman primarily and only secondarily as a Starfleet officer, Troy is visited aboard ship by her prospective in-laws, fiancé, and mother, played by, who else, Majel Barrett. Troy's mother entertains her daughter's colleagues with a series of artless, tactless, and tasteless remarks, mostly about sex. Perhaps it is not surprising that, after this embarrassing family visit, Troy and her intended husband agree to call the whole thing off. About those many uniforms, I suppose we ought to be grateful that now men are wearing them, too mostly extras who show up doing walkthroughs in the background of scenes, however, not characters with larger speaking parts, except once for Riker, who is, as noted previously, the resident hunk. Apparently, many uniforms may still suggest inferior status, hence they are seen far more frequently on women. But I digress. The remaining bri woman bridge crew member is Tasha Yar, the Enterprise's security chief. Yar has a hot temper. She is given to violent verbal and physical outbursts. As a security officer, frankly, she is also a major security threat. Yar is precisely the kind of trigger-happy redshirt who always got killed off in the original series shortly after beaming down to the planet. If she doesn't want to meet that fate this time around, she had better stop coming on like an avenging fury. Hey, Viewers would be legitimately annoyed by any security chief, male or female, with an obvious case of Rambo-itis. By the 24th century, after all, humanity is supposed to have grown beyond this violent aggressiveness, or at least that's what Picard told us in the first episode. So it seems to be still the same old story. Women appear as caricatures, as tokens, as decorative objects, 
but not as complete human beings, not as full equals with men. Have Gene Roddenberry and Paramount Pictures learned anything from Terry Nation? Alas, I fear not. Maybe we should send in Servalan to teach them a few more lessons. Thank you.